So we're on uh, Newton's laws, and we're going to apply them to the stuff in the solar system. So it's really the big project. Even though they work everywhere, they're universal. Um, historically, we just basically picked all the like really entertaining stories and people, even though they're all really important. Um, and we made it from ancient Greece, kind of cherry-picking a little bit of history, to 1700-ish AD. And at that point, there are five planets. They revolve around the sun. Everybody basically agrees with that in the literate world. A um, bunch of the planets have moons. Jupiter, uh, in particular, has four moons. Saturn has ears. And it's the rings. You just can't resolve them with the telescopes of the time. And even Jupiter's moons seem to obey this style of Kepler's laws. And this man, Newton, can actually describe why that's happening now. So um, Newton's laws, among other things, so we can derive Kepler's laws from them, absolutely, from the force law and the laws of motion. And we sketched out kind of how that works with just thinking, uh, reasoning through the ellipse and reasoning through the fact that um, Newton's law of gravity is attractive and acts in a line in between the bodies, but we'll go over that again. It can confirm Galileo's idea about relative motion. So now we can put a uh, set of precise terminology on that. And then finally, they work when Kepler's laws don't. So they're you know, there's an entire first half year of study that you do as a physics major, which is really just dedicated to, like, part of the work that this guy did. So understanding just Newton's laws. It's basically your first half of a year of studying physics. And it's not all orbits, so they work everywhere. Um, and they'll keep working in the cosmos even when we don't get these nice Keplerian orbits. So, right guy. Um, so all of the stuff that you need to know about Newton's laws of motion can be summarized with this astronaut. And let's, to make everything really crystal clear, even though we hope that doesn't really ever happen, it's, let's pretend that Earth isn't here and this astronaut is in the deepest depths of deep space. So picture one of those cosmological voids where there's one atom every meter cubed or something like that. And this astronaut is hanging out there by themselves. And the big breakthrough conceptually that Newton had um, versus, you know, the equivalent of Ptolemy to what Ptolemy was to astronomy, this um, person named Aristotle was to physics, like this old book that people just said, listen, we found this in a yard sale in like 800 AD, and you know, we believe that this is correct. So Aristotelian physics said that you had to have a force on something to keep it in motion. And it kind of jives with uh, just normal human experience, where if I want to push my bike down the street, if I ever let go of the back of my bike, my bike stops, right? And that's actually something that makes sense to us. Uh, what Newton did is he started thinking about what it would be like to push his bike in deep space. I don't think that's actually what he thought, but um, same idea. So this astronaut's in deep space, and this astronaut is moving at like one meter per second. What does this astronaut do for the rest of her life and then for infinity beyond? Exactly. Moves at the same exact, along the same straight line of trajectory at one meter per second. So this is Newton's first law of motion. And it seems to us like modern eyes and ears and brains to be like, okay, well that's sort of silly and redundant. Yes, it moves and you know, if I don't mess with it, it just keeps moving. But it was actually a pretty big breakthrough because people before then would go through all these like really bizarre contortions where if you shot an arrow, the arrow was pushing the air out of the front and then coming around and pushing the arrow in the back. And that's why an arrow would fly. And you see these diagrams. They're really crazy to us now. So that's law number one is astronauts going at one meter per second. It's never going to stop. Law number two is now concerned with, OK, we want to change quantities of motion. How do we change quantities of motion? So you change a quantity of motion with something called a force. And how effective a force is depends on the mass. So the mass is the sum total of protons, neutrons, electrons. It's basically how much stuff you are. It's not your weight. That's a different quantity. The mass is the thing that doesn't change. So I'm in deep space and I'm weightless. I still have mass. I'm still made up of like some amount of material. So the more material you are made of, the harder you are to have um, to accelerate, to change your quantity of motion. So if this is a 200 kilogram astronaut in spacesuit, it's going to be harder to stop her than a 100 kilogram astronaut in spacesuit if they're both going at that same one meter per second, and I want to stop them in the same amount of time. And the things that uh, are required to change your quantity of motion, they're called forces. 
Uh, we'll talk about some of their properties in a second. And then finally, the third one that everybody who has a sibling uh, knows about, even though you really didn't think about it in terms of Newtonian physics, is that now I have two astronauts, and two astronauts are you know, kind of close, and for some reason they decide to push off from each other. So this astronaut goes far back in that direction. What happens to the astronaut that pushed her in this direction? And if we're in deep space, what happens to those astronauts as per law number one? Forever and ever and ever. So terrible. Um, OK. So that's really all you need to know about Newton's laws. Any questions about them? OK. So I have a question then. If the two astronauts that pushed off against each other, one's 200 kilograms and the other one's 100 kilograms, so it doesn't really matter who pushes whom, they just push off against each other. Which one ends with the biggest final velocity? The 100 kilogram astronaut. What if the 200 kilogram astronaut pushed harder? It doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? It's this. So encoded in this is that those forces are always equal. And there's this sort of cognitive bias that you think that you know if I push against the wall, it looks like I'm actually doing some work, and the wall is very passive. If I were to measure it, the wall is actually pushing back on me with the exact equal amount of force. So it doesn't really matter how hard one appears to be pushing. Literally, the force in between them is the same number of you know, whatever unit you want to measure force in. You usually use Newtons. So it doesn't matter how they're pushed apart. They always have an equal and opposite force. So if you see like a dog tied by a leash to a tree or something like that, and the dog's straining against the leash, you realize it, but the tree's putting just as much force on the dog as the dog's putting on the tree. So that's really what Newton's third law means. The reason the 100 kilogram astronaut moves with a faster final velocity is because less mass, equal force, more acceleration. So his or her quantity of motion would change more. Less mass, more acceleration for an equal force. So this is the style of reasoning you'll need to do with um, the gravity exercise. OK. So there are a couple of details about this new thing. So we have two new words, acceleration and force. And you do need to understand a bit about them to reason correctly. So we have so far, we had their, I don't know, one minute physics lesson. Um, what is being depicted on this? Speed, right? Um, if this was a fancy one that told me what direction I was going into, like northeast or something like that, it would actually be telling me what? Velocity. So you kind of think about speed as just numbers, scalar quantities is what people call them. And velocity, a vector, it's more like an arrow. So it's got a size and it's got a direction. So right now, 190, hopefully kilometers per hour, is just a number. That's just a speed. But if I knew this car was traveling 190 kilometers per hour east or something, that would be what we call a velocity. So with that distinction in mind, acceleration is the change in velocity over some amount of time. So if it's the change in velocity over some amount of time, is acceleration a vector? Does it have a direction? Yes, it absolutely does. And you get to reason by drawing arrows and subtracting arrows. And I guarantee that at least somebody will get one of these wrong. So it's kind of fictitious, but I painted some, um, some compass points on these. So let's start with this car. So it starts at 30 kilometers per hour, and then it's driving due east, but it ends at 60 kilometers per hour. Is it accelerating? Yes. Which way is it accelerating? East. And the way that I would determine that is what I might do is I might draw the two vectors that represent its velocity. I might draw v final. And its final velocity is east, and it's long. And then its initial velocity is also east. But because it's 30 versus 60 kilometers per hour, I would draw it half as long. And when I look at the final minus the initial, or how much did I have to change vi to become vf, so change in v is v final minus v initial. I get a vector that looks like this. So if I add this to this, I get that. That's really what I'm saying. So that means that you know I have to 
ask how long did this process take, but that means that the acceleration is going to point in the same direction. Which way is the force? So maybe think about yourself as you're in this car and you're stomping on the gas pedal. Which way do you feel the force? Pushed back into the seat. So what's the seat actually doing by Newton's third law? Yeah, you feel smushed against the seat, but that's because the seat is being putting a force into your back. So force and acceleration are going this way. If I'm accelerating you east, the force has got to be east, the net force. So this is basically how we're going to have to reason through planetary orbits and maybe discuss some things that aren't quite perfect orbits. But everything about that seem OK. It's just a little bit of new terminology. So my final velocity is more the east than my initial velocity, so my acceleration had to be east. And Newton's second law says, get a pen that works. Um, Newton's second law says f equals m. m is just a number a. So f and a point in the same direction. OK, so let's do the bottom one next. Um, take a piece of scrap paper, turn the page in your notes, and repeat this entire argument for this. And if you want to do really well, make those arrows to scale with this arrow. So car starts driving east at 60 kilometers per hour, and then it stops. So also I'll point out that um, this is the only car that's obeying the speed limit or the uh, traffic sign. The other ones are dangerously out of control. So VI, VF, the change in it, and then which way you would feel a force. And then think about if I was sitting in the driver's seat of that car and hopefully I had my seat belt buckled, hint, hint, what would I be feeling and what would be putting that force on me? So the change in velocity is the change in velocity. The acceleration formally, or at least the average acceleration, is the change in velocity over the change in amount of time it took. But because the change in amount of time is just some number on a stopwatch, like half a second, two seconds, the vector-y part, they must point in the same direction. Uh, when you use deceleration is actually like kind of a, it's weirdly tricky and more subtle than you think. You use the term decelerating if, um, actually the easiest way of thinking about it is thinking about the speedometer on your car. So when the needle on your speedometer is going down, you're decelerating. When it's going up, you're accelerating. That's it. So this would be accelerating, actually. This one? This would be decelerating. But it gets tricky the second you start moving around in 2D. So let's say I'm like, you know, steering to the left or steering to the right. When do I say I'm decelerating? Even though I might be accelerating, I might have a non-zero acceleration. My speedometer needle might be in the same uh, position for the entire process. I'll bring that up again when we do this, because that's exactly what's happening in R2. So the speedometer needle for this one doesn't change, for instance. But then I'll ask, is it accelerating? So honestly, you just never get yourself in trouble if you never use the term decelerating. And you always treat it like a vector. So deceleration has something to do with the magnitude of this vector, if you know that stuff. OK. So what should vi look like? Yeah, so something pretty long looks like that originally. What does vf look like? Zero. I'll draw a zero vector like that. So how did I get from initial to final? So my change in velocity was this. So when I add this arrow to that arrow, I get 0. So I had to cancel this entire arrow. So my change in velocity was negative. I started with easterly velocity. I ended with no velocity. My change had to be in that direction. Does that make sense? So which way is my acceleration and which way is my force? 
And what do I feel when I actually do this? Pretend it's like last second slamming on the brakes. So acceleration would need to point in which direction? West. So I have a westerly acceleration. The net force that causes me and my car to accelerate would be west. So these all things just have different lengths, but they're the same thing. What's the thing that's putting the force on me personally? If I'm the driver, hopefully. Seatbelt, right? So when you stomp on the brakes, you feel a seatbelt pushing you in the backwards direction from whatever your velocity started as. Airbag, if you really screw up, would be exactly right. Yeah, so that would be a very large force. OK, so now we're ready for two. And this is important, because this is actually uh, the orbit of a planet. Is car two accelerating? I can just mess with you by not reacting. <laughs> Guess I'll have it right. So car two accelerating. Aha, exactly. So velocity is a vector. And even though the length of that vector might not be changing, so acceleration is a change in velocity, not a change in speed. So the speed isn't changing, but this vector, and you can, by pulling the exact same stunt, see that it is. So even though, you know, if we have this perfectly circular planetary orbit, the speed of the planet might not be changing. It's always accelerating. It's always feeling a force. Right? So what would VI look like in this case? Yeah, so tangent to the circle is kind of would be like this way. So I would call it what? Maybe northeast? So VI looks like this. What does VF look like, as precisely as you can tell me? Southeast. Should I make that vector longer or shorter? Good, I'm aggravating you guys. <laughs> OK, so I can pull the same stunt. Is how do I, what do I add to this vector to get that vector? And what I add to a vector that looks like this to turn it into that is a vector that goes straight down. So the change in velocity looks like this. So this vector plus that vector gets me to this. Which way is the acceleration? Which way is the force? Down, south, and south. Okay. And here's the, it's not really like 100% germane to the class, but for the car, what's the force that's keeping this thing in, the, in a circular trajectory? Yeah, so if you buttered the road, you wouldn't be able to keep doing that. So it's the friction force, static friction in between the tires and the road. And for you personally, if you don't have like bucket seats and you're not buckled in, what you might feel is you'll be squished up against the side of the door or something like that. So the side of the car will be pushing you downwards. If you really go around a tight circle. Okay, so that means that however we did it, there's a force that's pointing this way on average. And if we were to just continue this argument all around the circle, it would be pointing towards the center of the circle. So questions about that. This is what's going on in Newton's view in the solar system. And we'll just keep them circular for the moment. So if I want to spin a ball over my head and keep it in a circular orbit, its velocity at any given moment is tangent to the circle, but the force itself, which in this case is the tension force in the string has always got to be towards the center of the circle. So for these things, all the planets orbiting the sun, the overwhelming thing that's causing them to be um, pulled in these circular orbits is the gravitational attraction in between the sun and the planets. So what this means is that it looks like we can basically ignore all of this planet-planet stuff. So Venus doesn't really seem to care about Jupiter or Mercury. The sun must be putting an overwhelmingly larger gravitational force on all of these things, where we can basically ignore everything, with the exception of, you know, our moon seems to care about our gravity. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. But if I asked you, showed you a picture like this, 
and asked you to draw a vector that said, or an arrow that described the force on Jupiter from the sun. Could you do that? What if I asked you to draw an arrow that represented the force on the sun by the planet Mercury? Where would that point? Yeah, so this way. And how big would it be compared to the force of uh, the sun on Mercury instead of Mercury on the sun? Oh, they'd be the same length, why? But Mercury's so small. Yeah, because Newton's third law says they must be. It's kind of a beguiling fact, right? It's like you don't realize that we're pulling the Earth just as Earth is pulling us. Everybody has the same ammunition in the fight of forces. Uh, the difference is that the sun has a million times more mass. And by you know the same 100, 200 kilogram argument, um, astronaut argument, is that the million times more massive than the Earth's sun is just so much harder to move. It's got more mass. But yeah, everybody's fighting with the same ammunition in this kind of war of forces. You're going to get violent about it. OK. So this is the force that holds everything together. And the reason that we can sort of approximate things is circular, circular-ish, and say that only these two masses, sun and planet X, you know, for the planets, is important is because if I added up everything else, just not one planet individually, but everything, like swept Jupiter and Saturn and all the asteroid belt, which isn't that much, and the terrestrial planets and the Oort cloud into one big pile, it would be 15 hundredths of a percent of the mass of the sun. So the sun is the only thing that's important because overwhelmingly um, its mass is greater than all of these things. So Earth cares about sun's gravitational pull much more than it does um, with Mars, even though sometimes Mars does get a little bit closer. Except I am lying to you right now, and we'll talk about when that statement breaks down at the end of uh, this lecture. Okay. But this is okay, right? So we'll ask questions about this in exercise four. And again, this totally explains what was, uh, you know, beforehand a complete coincidence or made no sense whatsoever in uh, the Ptolemaic model, which is the speed which with uh, these planets seem to rotate and pass through the sky. Um, and Kepler said that they actually fall along a straight line, and now it seems to be that the slope of this straight line has something to do with, now we can actually say something to do with the mass of the sun. So if the sun was more massive, what we would do is we would actually tilt this line up and things would spin faster. And if the sun was less massive, it would tilt down and we would orbit more slowly. So we'll use this so much. So you find things orbiting other things and you look at how long it takes at what distance and you can find the mass of what's pulling them around in that orbit. OK. So it gets a little bit more complicated for the ellipse. But basically, you know, if you know that force is a vector, then you can you can reason through this correctly. So again, A to B in Kepler's law, planets falling, and then which way is the force on the planet at point B? It's in a direct line towards the sun. It's pulling this way, but it's also pulling a little bit greater than 90 degrees with the velocity. So it kind of slows it down a little bit, and it slows it down and slows it down more. So you get this equal area rules in the sense that the speed of the planet will be changing. That's because the force is a little bit behind it, and then the speed of the planet increases the force is a little bit above it. That's, again, totally hand wavy, and Newton did it right, and he did all of this. Um, so he had, uh, actually don't remember if he had, um, was using Roman numerals, but he basically invented calculus to solve some of these problems, but didn't want to unveil it, uh, unveil it to everybody, so he just did everything geometrically. So pretty impressive. OK, so almost in summary, this is the non-equation stuff about gravity that you should know. Forces, like velocities, have a size and a direction. So you've got to indicate them like an arrow. It points in a straight line in between the two gravitating bodies. It's always attractive. Things never repel by gravity. And then it gets bigger with the two masses increasing, and it gets smaller as the distance increases. And that actually falls off and gets big really quickly. So if you ever looked at the graph of a function that goes like 1 over r squared, it blows up which becomes important in a bit. So any questions about that stuff? Okay. So it was more physics. You all handled that very bravely. 
Um, the philosophy behind it is also really important and the fact that they're universal. And again, up until, you know, 16 something, um, and probably there was a, you know, people don't immediately accept a scientific idea overnight. What happens is the people who used to believe it and got tenure at an academic institution for writing books about it, they all die. And the younger people who believe the new idea take their place. Um, so over the course of the 17th century, people started accepting the idea that there was no like special earth science and space science. They were really the same thing. So again, the analogy of the apple is not like the apple hit Newton and knocked some sense into him. It was the fact that he realized that the moon always sort of falling towards Earth and missing it was the same force that made the apple fall. So he tells the story. Uh, I don't know. I don't think people will ever know. There's some, this is my memory, is that the story of the apple falling showed up so late in Newton's life that people tend to believe that he did it to kind of like tell a story about himself. And I'll say this about him is there are a lot of weird people in the history of science and Newton might be one of the weirdest and not in like a f like cuddly fun way. Um, he really had one friend. That friend was Sir Edmund Halley. Sir Edmund Halley single-handedly convinced him to write all of the books that he ended up writing. So otherwise, Isaac Newton would have never published a single word about science. He would have just like invented calculus, unraveled the mysteries of the cosmos, like kept it in a steamer trunk and died. Um, when he finally became, so he also did it out of spite because he hated another scientist who was about to invent calculus or he kind of heard cut wind that he was. So he's like, screw that guy, I'm going to publish before him. Um, lived alone, somebody sent a housekeeper to help him out. He freaked out because she was female and wouldn't let her in the house. He got a job at the Royal Mint. He invented the, um, you know, on the side of coins, they're kind of riffled. Do you know why that is? Yeah, exactly. So it's totally irrelevant now because our currency is debased. But back in the days where it was gold and silver, if you had a round edge, you could just shave off the edge and pass it on and nobody would notice. But Newton invented the riffled edge, so you can tell if they shave them. And he would preside over the um, trial and sentencing of counterfeiters. And apparently, he took great joy in watching them hang. He was a very strange dude. Um, so Stone, Greek, Solomon. Yes. All of that stuff is correct, yes. He was an alchemist. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, mercury has a history in alchemy, is that mercury seemed to be like, because there's a trick you can do with mercury. There's stuff called cinnabar that just kind of, it looks like an almost golden rock. And then I think it's like something to do with mercury and sulfur. And then you heat it up, and the mercury flows out, and then you can make it back. So it's like this really cool parlor trick. So people thought that mercury was like the key to making lead into gold and stuff like that. But yeah, Newton was an alchemist. Um, spent years and years and years working on alchemy. He believed that light was a particle, and part of his basis for believing that light was a particle was he stuck a wooden needle in his eye and put pressure on the side and saw colors and deduced that, I know, it's really gross, <laughs> that pressure on your eye was the cause of seeing color, and therefore what was happening is this particle gun was hitting the back of your eye. I'm sorry for that visual. I don't know. I think he was crazy on mercury fumes. I think it's like, um, be careful with the squares and rectangles. So I'm not telling you like you, you walk around with socks on your hands and stuff like that. And you know, all of a sudden you'll be like a genius or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've met some really boring, really brilliant people too in my, my lifetime doing this stuff too. So, but Newton is just like far and beyond. He's a really strange guy. So he's also held up as like the paragon of the enlightenment, like he's like this scientific icon and he's on stamps and I mean you just like look at him and he looks so freaking serious look at this guy and um, so somebody bought a trunk of his papers because they thought they were gonna have all the stuff and they found exactly what you said like he was pulling all the numbers out of the Bible to try to reconstruct the 
dimensions of Solomon's temple, so he could go in there and like hear Jehovah speak and stuff like that. It's, you know, weirdo. That one? Uh, yeah, crawling out of the terrestrial sphere. Some unknown manuscript from the 19th century. I just think it looked cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's, you know, he's all man. <laughs> 1840, yeah, maybe some rotten rye or something like that. So, Okay. So this is the miracle of science, is it doesn't matter if you're a crazy person. If you come up with something that works, it works. And Newton's laws really, really, really work. Um, this is a story from his, well, just leave it. I don't want to give stuff away. Uh, anybody know what this is? This thingy? Nope. <laughs> Earlier. So this is from, yes, the Bayou Tapestry. Do uh, you remember what it depicts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told you that nothing in astronomy is to scale. So this is northern France, and this is the English Channel, and this is England. Um, so that's King Harold of the English, and this is uh, William. I think probably why he did this was he was William the Bastard, and then he conquered England and became William the Conqueror, which is definitely a name upgrade. And they're all looking at this thing in the sky. There's a, believe it or not, there's a comet. So this is basically like a newspaper of the day, this long tapestry that you just kind of roll through, and it tells the comic book style story of the events. And so the Normans see this comet in the sky, comets are portents of doom, and then they say, you know, look, it's a portent of doom, and King Harold sees a comet in the sky and says, oh no, a portent of doom, and the Normans had the brilliant idea that let's be the doomers instead of the doomies. So they conquered England in 1066, and this is the story of that. So do you know what comet that is? Yeah, it's really big and it's really important and it's really bright and it's Halley's Comet. And uh, going through the historical record, Newton's only friend, uh, Sir Edmund Halley, realized that this comet, this mystery comet, shows up and it's so bright that everybody talks about it and it has the 76-year period. And he predicted that it would come back at such and such a time and he used Newton's laws to say there's an elliptical orbit and, oh my gosh, it's like right here, right now, and it's you know just coming past the orbit of Saturn. And I think he died two years before it showed up again, but he correctly predicted it would show up, and now it's named after him, so Halley's Comet. Yeah, Sir Edmund Halley. Yeah, so he never saw it, but the comet's named after him because he predicted it um, just after he died. So this is even crazier. So this is um, Uranus and Neptune, and so you can barely see Uranus with your uh, naked eye, but it moves really, really slowly. So it takes some telescopic observations to figure out that it's a planet and it is actually moving. So people figured out that it was moving according to Kepler's or Newton's laws, except it wasn't. So if you have long enough observations of Uranus, what you see is that it's actually not moving in a perfect ellipse. And I'm already starting to lie to you. It actually wobbles a little bit. And in 1840-something, a French mathematician said, well, we can explain the wobble in Uranus's orbit if there was a second gravitating body that was actually perturbing it. Because now these things are so far away from the sun and gravity falls off like 1 over r squared that now if they're close, there's going to be like a little nudge from this planet that we've never seen before. But I'm so good with Newton's laws that I can tell you where to look. And September 23rd, 1846, why don't you look over here? And somebody did and said, hey, that's a new planet. That's Neptune. So actually predicted that you should look for Neptune in some location in 1846. It was there, and it also uh, travels around the sun. Um, and then even when we add other forces that we ourselves made, um, I think you get kind of used to this stuff. But just to put some of this in perspective, is um, this is a picture you see when you see like a NASA, you know, program or you know. This is their deep space maneuver and it takes three years or something like that. So this is a rendezvous with a little asteroid. It's actually not incredibly little. But you take a machine with delicate instruments on it, like the size of maybe this table, twice as big, fire it off the surface of Earth, let it fly through space. It's basically got like a gas tank worth of power to do some maneuvering. Orbits three times, flies by one small asteroid, and then rendezvous with the second asteroid, 
two and a half years later. And now that you know stuff about the grapefruit model, we're talking about me leaving a pinhead and then rendezvousing with this asteroid, which is wouldn't even be you know observable, so it would be completely microscopic after traveling by tens and tens of meters in this scaled-down model. So it's really impressive. It's like you throw a piece of thread and then make it through the eye of a needle like four football fields away. So that's all done with Newton's laws. Newton's laws track the asteroids. Newton's laws pilot the spacecraft. So they work really well. He would have been, I don't know, probably would have been less angry. OK. So we're going to classify these two things. We'll call th something a Keplerian orbit. Um, if geometrically it makes an ellipse, so a nice closed ellipse, and we can characterize its eccentricity, like how much it's stretched. Um, but the important part is now we know when you get a Keplerian orbit or an ellipse. So you get a Keplerian orbit is when you only have to worry about, at least in the solar system, the sun's gravity. So only the sun's gravity is important. You get a nice ellipse. That's Kepler. If anything else is important, so either you're so far away from the sun, the planet or somebody coming by you, or maybe you have a close call with something else, and you and another um, gravitating body get so close that your 1 over r squared gets really, really, really big, then you're not. And we'll just say you're not in a Keplerian orbit. And the two things that can make that happen is either there's a second mass that's really appreciable, or uh, you get too close to a small mass, or there's another force present. So in this case of near, it's got a little motor on it that lets it do this. Okay. But Newton's laws describe them all. So Kepler, who wasn't a jerk, would have been really proud of him. So questions about that? Okay. So we're done with history, and we're done with physics for a little bit. Um, so we have telescopes, and we have this idea that mathematical laws describe both Earth and off of Earth. Um, and we're going to start doing astronomy really quickly and getting out into the uh, far reaches of the galaxy and then far reaches of the cosmos. So we're going to start with the solar system. And I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I always thought that solar system astronomy was actually kind of boring because you would these are like the books that your parents would get for you and these silly posters. Um, I just want to give a sense that there's still a lot going on. Um, so the discovery timeline. So. Herschel takes enough observations to realize Uranus is a planet. In 1801, the first of the asteroids is discovered. Um, 1846, successful prediction and then observation of Neptune. 1930, Pluto. 1992, the end of Pluto. So we discover it's living out an entire field of debris called the Kuiper Belt. Uh, 2004, no more Pluto. Some point in the future, Oort cloud. And we haven't talked about compositions of anything yet. So we may, at some point, have like a little deep sea submersible rolling around on Europa, and something might come up and lick the screen or whatever. That would be pretty cool, I think. Is that a question? Oort cloud. It's hypothesized. The Oort cloud is hypothesized, but the Oort cloud has not been directly observed. Ish. Um, it's kind of, so Pluto lives in the Kuiper belt, which is this chunk of so maybe the best way of saying it is uh, we have an asteroid belt of rocky debris, which is pretty close. We have a Kuiper belt, which is an icier version of the asteroid, which is asteroid belt, which is out near just past Neptune. There might be an even outerier, icier version of yeah the Kuiper belt called the Oort cloud, which might have half a trillion objects in it. Yeah, but the exactly the edge of a cloud surrounding the sun. But the edge of the Oort cloud is about like, it's easier to describe its distance in terms of a light year. So it's about 20% of the distance to the nearest star. But nobody's seen it because it's really far away. It's kind of hypothesized based on some stuff that falls in. Yeah. The Oort cloud, um, half a trillion sounds like a lot. And I don't know like a good number offhand. But the density of this would be less than the density of the asteroid belt. If you want to get a sense of how packed full of matter the asteroid belt is, which is more than the Oort cloud, um, I'm 
sorry to keep bombing people with these models, but if I gave you a grain of sand and somebody else a grain of sand and told you to stand on two city blocks, different city blocks, that's kind of like what we're talking about. So when you see the Empire Strikes Back and they're navigating through the, the odds of successfully navigating an asteroid field is like one, at least ours. It's like pretty easy. Um, so it's really not that much stuff. So we won't have to worry about, um, so the big problem, what you said is communications and telescopic observations. There's a huge problem out there. It's not the Oort cloud, it's interstellar dust. So it's all of the little fine debris, and the stuff that we call dust that's in between us and far off stars. But the compact stuff actually isn't really that much of an issue. Jeez, two months ago, Planet Nine. Yeah, yeah. that has to do with, um, so for one thing, I don't want to talk too much about it if somebody wants to choose that as a course presentation. But what it has to do with um, is we now know enough about the Kuiper Belt. And the short story is that the things in the Kuiper Belt, the big blobs of stuff like Pluto, so the dwarf planets, they're not real planets is they seem to be aligned in a funny way, as if they're being kind of shepherded by something. And these people hypothesize that the planets that we see, the dwarf planets like Pluto, their orbits are so unlikely unless there was something out there. So it's not an observation of a planet. It's the suggestion that the other planets, dwarf planets' orbits are caused by this actually rather big thing that's really far away. I think it's like 200 astronomical units or something. Yeah, so it's not like a smoking gun. It's not like somebody saw a picture of this cool new planet or something. It's kind of like, it's this very um, kind of, I don't know. Yeah. I know, absolutely. Yeah, this is the thing that happens, and I didn't want to mention it because, for one thing, I don't want to seem like I'm cynical, and I don't want to make you guys preemptively cynical. But when you get stuff through the filter of something like Universe Today or Space News, is even though they're they are kind of pumping the tires of science and doing good work, is that they have to clickbait too, you know? So they have to write these stories, and you can't be like, you can't be as as intellectually honest as somebody who is like, for instance, at a conference would have to be. I couldn't say that there is strong evidence based on an indirect mathematical analysis that there might be a, like nobody's gonna read that. So there is a ninth planet. So just be aware that that's happening. And you know, you can be excited, but then don't you know, totally fall in love with planet nine. It's not like a 100% done deal yet. Yeah. Uh, the discoverer, actually. Yeah, so there is, um, although for Pluto, the person who named it, it was uh, left up to a contest. And I think an English school, school girl came up with Pluto. And the American head of the Astronomical Society, um, his name was Percival Lowell. He approved. So the symbol, the, yeah, the astrological symbol for Pluto was his initials. So it was a very, very adroit suggestion, actually. We ran out, right? Yeah, so we, um, wait till we get to the Kuiper Belt objects, is that they discovered 20 of them in short order in the late 1990s. And so they're like Sedna and Kwa'owar, like Sedna is, I don't know, like an Inuit goddess or something like that. And we're just like, <laughs> we're running out of deities. Um, so in short order, you know, it's just people ran out. Yeah. Stars with numbers has to do with the, yeah, has to do with the multiplicity of catalogs. So you guys already know that the North Star, Polaris, and Alpha Ursa Minor are the same thing. It's got like 50 other names because somebody will call it this, you know, it's like HD blah, 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 and the HD catalog, and in another catalog it'll have another name. So when stars have numbers, partly it could be because, like, that's just the catalog name. But I don't know, only 6,000. I'm sorry, you can buy them now, right? So you can name them after your dead dog and stuff. Um, yeah, you can actually. Yeah. 
the right ascension and declination only. Yeah. So there are ways of mapping those things onto other things, and there's a huge database. In fact, you can go online and type in like RA and DEC, and it'll give you that patch of the sky. But the reason to care about the catalog names is because if you have an astronomical catalog, you did it with one particular instrument. And when you really start caring about what you saw, the properties of the instrument become important. So implicitly, when somebody says SDSS, da 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 da, I'm like, oh, I know you use the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope, and I know that these are the properties of your data, and I know that you didn't see this, but you did see this because you used this, you know, the thing in Apache Point, or know, yeah, know what biases you have and stuff like that. So it's it's more meaningful, and nobody will ever get rid of the individual names, because they do mean something. Good. Other questions? Just went through half of the quarter. Um, okay. So we're going to take a whirlwind tour of this and then um, stop. I don't know what time it actually is. I don't think it's 10.50. Eight hours forward. Okay, exactly eight hours, good. Um, so we'll s actually talk about this last because um, you know this gets us into nuclear fusion. Um, for right now, just think about the sun as everything but 15 hundredths of a percent of the mass in the solar system. And it sits in the middle, and it pulls everything around by the force of gravity. The next chunk of things we're going to talk about, and the moon will be included in this too, because compositionally, you know, the moon's about yay big, and Mercury, for instance, has more in common with the moon than it does with Venus or Earth. Um, we'll talk about the terrestrial planets or the inner planets. Terrestrial planets is a better name for reasons you'll understand when we get to exoplanets. They're all rocky. They have atmospheres of some type or another. Um, few moons, we have more of a coplanet than a moon. Ours happen to be close. We'll talk about whether or not that's a generic feature. And they are two thousandths of the total mass of the solar system, even though we like to think we're more important than that. Afterwards, we'll stop at the asteroid belt. Um, most of them, so there's one that's 950 kilometers across. So only the biggest one is about the size of like Washington and Oregon and Idaho, I guess. Um, most of them are probably what you expect or know is they're sprinkled in between Mars and Jupiter. But they're oddities, and they're weird resonances within the main belt, and there are some things that cluster outside of the main belt. And then we'll talk about their composition, and that'll be next week. Um, the outer planets, I'm not going to use that term. Um, so we'll mostly call them the Jovian planets or the gas giants. Basically, all atmosphere. And it turns out the right way of talking about them is as a Jovian planetary system. They're almost like mini solar systems. So they have this central large body. They all have ring systems. It's not really as apparent for the other planets as it is for Saturn. And they have many, many, many moons. And their moons are incredibly interesting. And they're basically like the, you know, whatever the sun doesn't comprise, the gas giants basically make everything else up. Um, so that missing 14 hundredths of that missing 15 hundredths of a percent. After that, we have this thing called the Kuiper Belt, which is what Pluto got um, demoted into when Pluto got unplanetized. It basically starts at 30 AU, goes out to 50, and it's this sort of donut of material, um, which is a little bit icier than the asteroid belt. And this is our source of comets. So they're probably about you know, 50 to 100,000 reasonably sized ones. And they gift us things like Halley's Comet. And we'll ask why. So when we do that, that's when we'll talk about comets. And then finally, there's this thing called the Oort cloud, which is hypothesized. So nobody's gone out and, you know, grab some Oort cloud objects. Um, it seems to have this walnut uh, shell kind of material uh, shape to it. But there's really strong evidence. I don't think you'd find somebody who says, like, I don't believe in the Oort cloud. Um, he's like a reputable astronomer. And just note that this is in a logarithmic scale. So this is 1 AU, so that's Earth. 10 AU, that's Saturn. 100 AU, this is the edge of the Kuiper belt. 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. This is about a light year. So our Oort cloud may go out to a light year. And the basic argument beyond, behind the Oort cloud is that every once in a while you see a comet come in and you use Newton's laws and you say, hey, this comet's going to return in 27,000 years. This comet's going really far away from us. And sometimes that comet seems to come from way above the plane of the ecliptic. So it's a very strange comet indeed. So. Voyager, I mean, it will. Um, and I guess it's a question of 
Yeah, Voyager is in the plane of the ecliptic, so in some sense it kind of is now. Whether it will leave the Oort cloud is um, intact is a different question, and asking me to do, what's that? Planet X, uh, so I don't even know where that's supposed to be. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's okay. So remember the grapefruit model is like the likelihood of two cosmic bodies just smacking into one another is just so unfathomably low. You know, you're talking about marbles separated by 15 football fields and stuff like that. So Voyager's gonna miss it all. Um, when it will get there is, so it's about 100 AU now and that took about 30 years. So to get to 50,000 AU is gonna take longer than our lifetime. Okay. So call it a quarter of a million years. And then somebody could check that for me. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is the part where I come clean and, um, and, and if you thought carefully about the moon or something like that, you would have known that I was lying to you. Is that, is this really true? Is it really true that, you know, this very flat, all-encompassing general statement that the sun is 99.85% of the total mass of the solar system and, you know, it's a million times more massive than the Earth. So anytime I compute an orbit, I only have to care about the sun. So what is the evidence that that's absolutely ridiculously untrue? Yeah, we have a moon. That's definitely true. There's also something on the moon that I think somebody mentioned that I didn't quite catch that's a living record of something else. So you can do this. Um, and the, sometimes it just randomly happens. Sometimes we engineer it. And this is how we got Voyager, for instance, going so fast is... Uh, you can gravitationally slingshot something. So you engineer an orbit where, um, so what if the mass is small? I can compensate for that by making the denominator of this really small. So I can get this thing really, really close to, for instance, Jupiter. And it swings by Jupiter, and Jupiter puts a huge gravitational tug on it, zips the spacecraft off much faster. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a legitimate tactic. It happened a lot. So this, yeah, yeah, the science in that book is actually pretty good. The part with the, um, yeah, and the idea of making fake gravity with a rotating. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. No, the idea of like making a. Uh, yeah, a space station and you spin it and then basically like the gravitron oh, yeah, effect yeah. makes it feel like gravity. That's just like subtly brilliant, I think. Um, you gotta make this ring really big or else you get all these vertigo effects. But yeah, there's a lot of really good stuff in Clark's writing. Okay, so we could engineer this, we do engineer this. I've just told you that, you know, in between the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, there are tens of thousands of things all swirling around and Grapefruit model aside, do you think that every once in a while something wanders by something else? Yeah. And in fact, you know that um, you know even the orbit of Mercury gets a little bit perturbed by this. Um, so I'll leave this if you guys want to play it. So you can experience the aggravation of trying to get a truly stable solar system with more than three bodies in it if they're all appreciably large. But we see some really subtle evidence that um, more than the sun is at play, and this is one of them, and this is one that actually has some like dire consequences for, um, I don't know, for certainly some older creatures on Earth, is that this is like, just think about it as a histogram of the number of asteroids at uh, a distance. So this is one AU where Earth is, oh man, there's some asteroids there, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but that's kind of scary. There's 2AU, so Mars is about there, and um, here is Jupiter. And what do you notice? This isn't some weird encoding effect, so the picture is correct. What do you notice about the main belt? Yeah, so what about that, and that, and then that, that? 
And in particular, there are these very sharply carved dead spots, right? So dead spot, dead spot, dead spot. And it's true, if you were to look at like the, um, the main belt of asteroids and you were to make all the asteroids bigger so that they actually filled up an appreciable amount of space, it would kind of look the way that a record, like an old vinyl record looks, where there are these gaps in between them. What do you think causes gaps in the density or location of asteroids in the asteroid belt? Gravity of other asteroids, potentially? They all hit each other there or something? It's, it's weird, though. It's very regular and clockwork-like. And this is that, um, it's kind of exaggerated, but this is that record-like picture. So to get the answer right, you need to think a little bit about Kepler's third law and then Newton's law of gravity. And the fact that, you know, if I were to pick the second biggest gravitational bully in the solar system, it would be Jupiter. So what I know is that, uh, so let's start with Earth. So Earth goes around once every year, um, Jupiter once every 10 years or so. And then somewhere out here, there's something that's going around once every five years. So one year, 10 years, five years. So every time this asteroid goes around twice, Jupiter goes around once, they line up. What does Jupiter do when the asteroid is here and Jupiter's there? Gives a little tug. And then 10 years later, what happens? They line up again, Jupiter gives a little tug. 10 years later, they line up, Jupiter gives a little tug. And so there are these resonances that form. And if you're in, you know, you orbit three times every time Jupiter orbits twice, you and Jupiter keep finding yourself in the same spot. It's like your commuters that ride the same bus. Jupiter keeps pulling you and pulling you and pulling you. And eventually, the orbits get depleted, just get knocked out of their stable orbits. And so this is the action of Jupiter, those two, over the course of, you know, let this happen for a billion years, and all the orbits that are in sync or in resonance with Jupiter get depleted. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Where do you think they go? <laughs> Might fall into Jupiter. Yeah, they just get destabilized. They get kind of nudged out of their nice stable orbit. Um, where does all this perturbed stuff go? And this picture is a little bit more uh, leading. Yeah. Is it just the moon? What's so special about the moon? Yeah, so the moon definitely has this big cratering record on it. And we'll talk at the end of class about why the moon looks really cratered and we don't. Um, but really, if you have any, you know, we don't have any soil or water to cover impacts. If you find any rocky body in the solar system, you know, Jupiter has all these clouds and you really can't see craters on Jupiter because it's mostly atmosphere. But anything with no atmosphere, no water, no, um, no soil, it looks like this. And it's preserving the legacy of being beaten up by all of this perturbed stuff. So these tens of thousands of, um, sorry, hundreds of thousands of asteroids, tens of thousands of Kuiper Belt objects, and every once in a while they get close, or you know, you give somebody enough time and they'll nudge you out of your orbit. Is that they just end up in chaotic orbits, so non-Keplerian, so nothing nice and stable and pleasant, so something bad and potentially hazardous. Um, is there evidence of this happening on Earth? We do. Um, famously, we have this. Yeah, so you will burn up in the atmosphere if you're, you know, honestly, anything about tabletop size or, or smaller. Um, that's not really like a, the ones we're worried about, right? So if you see something here, um, these pixels have to be at least a kilometer across. So these are large asteroids. Um, so the most famous one on Earth is this, actually. So this is just the seafloor bed and a picture of the so-called gravitational anomaly. There's this big crater that's basically the entire Yucatan Peninsula. And the radiometric dating puts this giant crater, which is you know 180 kilometers across on the, basically it is the Caribbean, at uh, 65 million years old. So what was that? Yeah. And 50,000 years ago, this is in uh, Arizona. So this thing is about uh, two kilometers across. 
somebody thought that they could mine for the iron asteroids. So there's a mining camp. It's the saddest thing ever down there. So Arizona is as close as we get in the United States to the moon. So this has preserved the record for us. And then 104 years ago, this was probably a comet, is that in the middle of Siberia, um, all of a sudden in, this was uh, maybe 105 now, I think in 1908, um, all of the seismometers on Earth went off. And then beautiful sunsets and the seismometers seem to indicate that the epicenter of this weird uh, seismic event was from central Siberia. Some poor people went out, trekked out to look at it. And what they found is a crater with no debris. And this crater was tremendous, right? So if it hit Moscow, there would have been no Moscow. So this is a so-called Tunguska event. And that's in like pretty modern time. So this stuff actually does happen pretty frequently. Um, so we do have, you know, Keplerian, but then realize that if you get too close to something else or if you allow something to just slowly perturb you and erode your nice even orbit, it's not the whole story. So in fact, when we talk about even the early system, history of the solar system, um, planets were not always where the planets are. So we, you know, Earth was spinning at a much faster day, like 10 hour day, the moon was closer. Um, the Jovian planets themselves may have scanned out and depleted the asteroid belt. So um, over the course of a year, okay, but over the course of cosmic time, this stuff is not as stable as you might think. So that's our tour of the solar system. What you guys are now on the hook for is um, just those sections, so if I asked you what came before what, so what's closest to the sun, so you've got some uh, terrestrial planets, an asteroid belt, Jovian planets, Kuiper belt, or cloud, so just that. And over the course of the next week, we'll pick through all of those things and get into them in detail. So any questions about that stuff? How likely are we to be killed by a dinosaur killer? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's another feature off of the coast of Australia called the um, the Bedout impact structure, which might be even bigger. And there's another structure that's about um, even bigger still that dates back to about two billion years ago. That's somewhat in doubt, but there's no like multi, you know, there's no like appreciably complex life. Two thousand, or sorry, two billion years ago on Earth, so nobody cares. The cutoff for having an impactor that has global effect, I think, is like a kilometer across. But what you're talking about is a rock the size of like downtown Seattle hitting us, which, I mean, that only happens every 10 million years or so. So yeah, 35 million years ago, uh, there was a multiple impact structure. And so one hit Atlantic City, which wasn't there 35 million years ago. Another formed the Chesapeake Bay is also an impact structure, basically, in Maryland. And they left about 120 kilometer craters. So 35 million years or so. So it's on the million year time scale, it's pretty frequent. Yeah. Yeah, excellent question, because this becomes, uh, it's almost too convenient, because there was a time when, and thankfully we're done with it, but there was a time when impacting was a little bit more frequent, a lot more frequent, um, right as the solar system was finishing its formation. And people call this, it's like the, I don't know, it's like the, um, the explanation for anything that's weird in the solar system. So Venus has a 90-day Earth day rotation period. So one Venus day is 90 Earth days. People just say, oh, it got hit by something huge, and it slowed its orbit down. Uranus is tilted by 90 degrees. People say, oh, it got hit by something huge, which tilted it. We have a co-planet. So like, oh, we got hit by something about the size of Mars, and it knocked stuff off of us, and it formed and made our co-planet. So this idea of really, really large impactors causing things like that, all the stuff that doesn't quite make sense in the solar system, it's absolutely true, and it's absolutely um, the best theory out there, I guess, is the way of saying it. Yeah. Um, the odds of that happening now are really small because we're running out of Mars-sized planetesimals. 
So um, the early history of the solar system was a little bit more dynamic. Um,